crucial housekeeping things. We're going to be live tweeting throughout using uh, IFG events and the hashtag IFG John Major. Please do follow and tweet along and we're going to have a video and sound recording up within 24 hours. So John, thank you very much indeed for joining us and we're very much looking forward to your remarks. In democracy we trust. Thank you. Well, Bronwyn, thank you and uh, good morning everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here and I think it's an apt time to talk about the subject I'm about to address. We're living at the moment through a time of uncertainty and political turbulence, both overseas and at home. And at home, we tend to take democracy for granted. We should not. It's far more complex than simply having the right to vote. In many countries at the moment, there's a widespread discontent of the governed. And democracy, in many places, is in retreat. And nor is it in a state of grace in the United Kingdom. In the last decades of the 20th century, the number of democratic countries drew quite dramatically. The arbiter of civil liberties, Freedom House, classified 110 countries as democratic. Indeed, Democrats were so confident that their way of government was the wave of the future that they stopped arguing for it. And their confidence was premature. In each of the last 15 years, democracy has shrunk a little as political and civil liberties have been diminished. In many countries, democracy has never taken root. Where it has, it risks being weakened by populism, often with added xenophobia, or muzzled by elected autocracy. It's challenged by protest groups or new and more extreme political movements. Even our great allies in the United States are facing populist attacks on their democracy. And we should beware when America sneezes, we often catch their cold. Now, good government, by which I mean democratic government, has a duty to deliver unwelcome messages to electors. That isn't easy. It isn't easy in a world in which politicians are under continuous scrutiny from an uncontrolled internet, a 24-hour media, and an increasing number of impatient special interest groups. Unwise promises are made to placate critics or to win votes. And when these promises are not met, the public loses a little more faith. The hard truth is, while government can do much, it can't do everything. All problems can't be swiftly and painlessly resolved on demand. It is literally an impossible task. If politicians admit that, they earn trust and respect. But discontent grows when inequality widens, or incomes stagnate, or problems seem unsolvable. And the benefit of the doubt, that most precious of all political commodities, is lost when governments seem to be failing. In the last 20 years, a financial crash, unpopular wars, faltering globalisation, and an unfair distribution of the benefits of growth have all contributed to the present sour resentment of government. Our democracy here in the UK has always been among the strongest and most settled in the world. It rests on the conviction that the United Kingdom government acts for the well-being of all four of our nations. With nationalism growing in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, not everyone shares that conviction. Our system relies also upon respect for the laws made in Parliament, upon an independent judiciary, upon acceptance of the conventions of public life and on self-restraint by the powerful. If any of that delicate balance goes astray, as it has, as it is, our democracy is undermined. And our government is culpable in small but important ways of failing to honour those conventions. Where governments do fall short, candour is the best means of binding up support. But that candour must be freely offered, not dragged out under the searchlight of inquiries. If it's not wholehearted and convincing, the loss of public trust can be swift and unforgiving. We have seen that playing out in recent weeks. Trust in politics is at a low ebb, eroded by foolish behaviour and leaving a sense of unease about the way in which our politics is conducted. Too often, Ministers have been evasive, and the truth has seemed to be optional. 
when ministers respond to legitimate questions from the public, from inquisitors, from the media, with pre-prepared sound bites or half-truths or misdirection or wild exaggeration, then respect for government and politics dies just a little more. Misleading replies to questions invite disillusion. Outright lies breed contempt. In our democracy, we are lucky. We are able to speak truth to power. But if democracy is to be respected, power must also speak truth to the people. And yet in recent years, they have not been doing so. There has been cynicism about politics from the dawn of time. We're told that politicians are all the same. And this untruth conditions electors to condone lies as though they were the accepted currency of politics. But politicians are not all the same. And lies are just not acceptable. To imply otherwise is to cheapen public life and slander the vast majority of elected politicians who do not knowingly mislead. But some do mislead, and their behaviour is corrosive. It tarnishes both politics and the reputation of Parliament. It is a dangerous trend. If lies become commonplace, <coughs> truth ceases to exist. What and who, then, can we believe? The risk is nothing and no one. And where are we then? Parliament's an echo chamber. Lies can become accepted as fact, which, as the Speaker has pointed out, has consequences for policy and for reputation. That is why deliberate lies to Parliament have been fatal to political careers and must always be so. If trust in the word of our leaders in Parliament is lost, then trust in government will be lost also. At number 10, the Prime Minister and officials broke lockdown laws. Brazen excuses were dreamed up. Day after day, the public was asked to believe the unbelievable. Ministers were sent out to defend the indefensible, making themselves look gullible or foolish as they did so. Collectively, this has made the government look distinctly shifty, which has consequences that go far beyond political unpopularity. No government, no government, can function properly if its word is treated with suspicion. A recent report by the Constitutional Unit of UCL tells us that the public trusts the courts more than the civil service, the civil service more than parliament, and parliament more than the prime minister. The lack of trust in the elected portion of our democracy cannot be brushed aside. Parliament has a duty to address this and correct this. And if it does not, and trust is lost at home, our politics is in no man's land, in disarray, broken. If trust in our word is lost overseas, we may no longer be able to work effectively with friends and partners for mutual benefit or even security. Unfortunately, that trust is being lost, and our reputation overseas has fallen because of our conduct. We are weakening our influence in the world. We should be wary. Even a casual glance at overseas comment shows our reputation is being shredded. A nation that loses friends and allies becomes a weaker nation. And when ministers attack or blame foreign governments to gain populist support at home, we are simply not taken seriously. Megaphone diplomacy merely increases hostility overseas. International trust may not be easy to regain. Our way of life is built around the maintenance of law. The public expect, expect our government to work within the law and within the accepted rules of public life. It was unprecedented when the government broke the law by proroguing Parliament, presumably to avoid debates on Brexit that might not have gone as they wished. I had promised in a BBC interview 
that if the government attempted to muzzle Parliament, I would challenge their action in court. And so I did. Not as swift, though not as swiftly as the civil rights campaigner, Gina Miller. Lawyers presented our cases separately to the Supreme Court, but they were, in essence, identical. Both our challenges were upheld unanimously by the Supreme Court, who ruled that the government's actions were unlawful. It was, the court said, impossible to conclude there was any reason, let alone a good reason, for proroguing Parliament for five weeks in the run-up to Brexit. The Prime Minister said he disagreed with the court, and the then Leader of the House accused the Supreme Court judges of, I quote, a constitutional coup. The government accepted the verdict, but in bad faith. It did not apologise, and nor did it mend its ways. It went on to introduce legislation giving the government the power to break international law, albeit, as one minister conceded, I quote, in a limited but specific way, unquote. Fortunately, this issue fell away, but it was a proposal that should never have been put forward. The government then cut overseas aid, which Parliament had set in legislation at 0.7% of gross domestic product without the prior approval of Parliament to do so, although in fairness to the government, that was obtained retrospectively sometime later. And the government that acts this way is the government that fought a referendum to, I quote, protect the sovereignty of Parliament and the sanctity of domestic law, but not, it seems, from themselves. All of this is against the backdrop of the Prime Minister being investigated for several apparent breaches of the ministerial code. He chose to ignore critical reports on his ministers, rejected advice from his independent advisor on ministerial standards, who resigned as a result, and attempted but failed to overturn a unanimous standards select committee report that condemned the behaviour of a parliamentary colleague and friend. It may be possible to find excuses for each of these lapses and others, but all of them taken together tell a different tale. The Prime Minister and our present government not only challenged the law, but seem to believe that they and they alone need not obey the rules, traditions, conventions, call them what you will, of our public life. The charge, the repeated charge, that there is one law for the government and one for everyone else is politically deadly and it has struck home. Our democracy requires that the truth and the law should be respected and obeyed, above all, by the government. But sometimes it seems that even if it is obeyed, it is not always respected. When a leading tabloid labelled judges, I quote, enemies of the people, the then Justice Secretary did not leap to their defence. Other cabinet ministers publicly disparaged lefty lawyers, activist lawyers, and even attacked judges for exceeding their authority. Public denunciation of judges and lawyers gives credence to the belief amongst the legal profession that the government may wish to usher in a compliant judiciary. It should back off. The late Lord Bingham, one of our greatest judges, once remarked there are, and I quote, are countries where the judges always agree with the government, but they are not countries in which any of us would wish to live. That was true then and it remains true today. There have also been legislative assaults on civil rights, not all of them successful. The government briefed but rode back from a serious attack on judicial review. But the intent was there and may return. It proposed legislation to allow the police to, quote, stop and search, unquote, anyone at a protest meeting, uh, a quote, without any cause for suspicion. It attempted to legislate to allow the police to impose conditions on protest marches likely to be noisy. These are not the only examples I could give you. 
Apart from being almost certainly unworkable, such proposals will have alienated the public from the police. I'm old enough to recall anti-poll tax marches, anti-war marches, and anti-Brexit marches, which attracted huge numbers and were most certainly noisy. Would those have been banned under this sort of legislation? Because the intent of those pro protesters was not to prevent the public from going about their normal lives. They were the public, expressing deeply felt opposition to government policy. But although marches may be uncomfortable for any government, protest marches are a safety valve for democracy and for free speech. Democracy should treat them with care. The government was lucky. Lucky that the House of George reje uh, Lords rejected these proposals, but there is no certainty they will not return in another bill. Such a denial of civil rights is wrong in principle and in practice. If the power of the state grows and the protections of the law diminish, then the liberties of the individual fall. The mother of parliaments should simply not permit this. We, uh, we British, are a kindly people. When appeals are made for those in distress at home or abroad, the good heart of our nation responds with compassion and with generosity. But increasingly, across the Western world, populist pressure leads to governments to be less generous to refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. At present, an astonishing estimated 70 million people are displaced, three times as many as at the end of the Second World War. In the next 30 years, climate change may force a further 143 million people to leave their homes. To this, we must add unknown numbers of families fleeing from intolerable hardship and repression. The problem is huge, and the problem is growing. It needs a collaborative and international solution to help deal with refugees, and also to protect the target communities that now bear the burden of this enlarged immigration. Without such an approach, the next generation will be left to face an unsolvable problem. In America, they build walls to keep migrants out. In Europe, they build camps to keep them in. Here in the UK, the government wishes to remove British citizenship from dual nationals without any notice or right of appeal. It proposes also serious action against criminal gangs that traffic migrants, and rightly so, in my view. But it also proposes to criminalise the migrants themselves. We really should search our souls before we do this. Can it really be a crime? Really be a crime to be frightened, homeless, desperate, destitute, fleeing from persecution or war or famine or hardship? Can it really be a crime to cross half the world on foot and dangerous waters in an unsafe boat in the hope of finding a better life? Of course, if the numbers are too large, this creates an appalling problem for local host communities. But surely, to seek sanctuary from an unbearable life cannot morally be treated as a crime. Yet the government's borders bill proposes to punish asylum seekers who take an unsanctioned route with a jail sentence of up to four years. There must be a better way to protect areas such as Kent than filling our prisons with these miserable unfortunates whose only real crime is to seek a better life for themselves and their families. Prison for these refugees is punishment without compassion. I do sympathise with the awful problem facing the government on this issue. But these proposals are not natural justice and seem to me to be decidedly un-British. I hope the government will reconsider. We in the UK have long been admired for having the highest standards in public life. We are not perfect. 
There is, was no golden age, but for generations we have been seen from abroad as setting an example for others to follow. Many years ago, in the wake of a scandal that became known as Cash for Questions, I set up the Nolan Committee on Standards in Public Life. Nolan set out guidelines to guard against poor behaviour. Recently, in a very comprehensive report, the committee, now under the chairmanship of Lord Evans of Weardale, reported that we need more vigorous enforcement of ethical standards. It would be reassuring if the appointment of the guardians of ethics was fully independent and, where appropriate, with new powers to initiate, investigate and report. That should be put on a statutory basis. In a foreword to this report, I endorse the committee's recommendations in full and I hope the Prime Minister will accept them without delay. If he were to agree to this, it would make a start, it would help to regain the UK's reputation as the standard for democracy, for fairness, for honesty and for pragmatic common sense in protecting our national interests. That reputation, built up by our predecessors, is invaluable to our national interests. It should be protected, not demolished. The style of our present government sometimes creates its own problems, not least for them. It looks at enemies where there are none. Moreover, it then has a habit of choosing the wrong enemies. Most recently, it's been waging campaigns against the civil service and the BBC. In neither case is this wise or justified, or even in the government's own best interests. The civil service is a support structure to government. Treating it as a hostile blob which seeks to undermine the government is both foolish and wrong. As for the BBC, it's a crucial part of our overseas soft power and a policy of undermining it and starving it of funds is self-defeating for UK national interests. Ministers should remember that both these institutions are more trusted than the government itself. The government should focus their attentions on reforms to improve public life. Finally, there is rarely a good time for a bad idea. But sometimes, when faced with the alternatives, a bad idea can appeal. So it is with the funding of politics. The present funding of our democratic system leaves it prey to special interests. The Conservative Party is too dependent upon business and a small number of very wealthy donors. The Labour Party is in hock to trades unions and a different cadre of donors. Minor parties are also obligated to funders. This carries risks that besmirch politics. Many people believe, sometimes wrongly but not always, that honours are offered as a reward for funding a democratic system, that uh, donors are given access to ministers and are thus able to influence policy to their own advantage. It is a perception that corrupts our system. The honours system is cheapened and the political system is made to look corrupt. This damages democracy. It is time to refocus on how our politics is funded. The system needs cleansing. It must never be the plaything of the rich nor of pressure groups. Yet no one wants their politics fully funded by the state. Certainly, I don't. But I do think changes are necessary. Legislation should limit funding by individuals, by companies, by trade unions, to sums that no one can reasonably claim would entitle the donor to favours, to rewards, or to undesirable access. Donors must not be seen to sway policy through an open checkbook. If a restriction on donations means an increased level of public funding of political parties, of elections, of referendums, then so be it. I don't personally like this outcome, but it is the lesser of the evils, and despite my distaste for it, is a price worth paying if it removes any suggestion of corrupt advantage 
and restores the reputation of representative democracy. One man, one vote is a sound principle. And this essential fairness should not risk being undermined by any one man and his money. Our democracy is a fragile structure. It is not an impenetrable fortress. It can fall if no one challenges what is wrong or does not fight for what is right. The protection of democracy depends upon Parliament and the government upholding the values we have as individuals and the trust we inspire as a nation. But those values can't be partial, can't be occasional, can't be taken out and paraded for political convenience. They are eternal. Democracy is a lifelong companion, not a passing fancy. Trust, integrity and values are the structure upon which our democracy is founded. If they're rooted in our politics and in our way of life, they provide a pathway to take any child from the back streets of their youth to the pinnacle of their ambition. We must protect this way of life. It is more precious than any government, any political party, or any individual. For many years, traveling the world, I have been received as the lucky representative of the most stable democracy of them all. The UK was seen as the democracy tested by time whose virtues had built the mother of parliaments and a free, independent and fair legal system that was widely copied, all held together by a language that united the world. We were seen as the freest of nations, safe in our island with allies and partners in every corner of the world. It was a position of influence, built up over centuries, envied, praised and copied. All of this gave the United Kingdom a unique position in the world. It was not simply the influence of military or political power, but the influence of example, which is as important as trust. And trust matters. It matters for self-respect. It matters for gentle persuasion. It matters for hard, uncomfortable decision-making. It matters for our parliament. It matters to our country. It matters to our United Kingdom. It matters in how we are perceived by others near and far, friend or foe. And it matters for the long-term protection and well-being of our democracy. Thank you very much. John Major, thank you very much indeed for that. Let me ask you a few things, and I'll come to the questions in the room. We have, we're have delighted to have uh, a live audience um, for the first time. Uh, we're just beginning to get back to that, but also loads of questions are coming in online. Thank you very much. Do keep sending them. There's some terri terrific ones already. I'll mix them both, both up. John Major, you make occasional statements about the state of government, state of, state of democracy. Why this one now? Uh, I think really because I thought it was necessary. Uh, I'm not suggesting that our democracy is in danger of collapse or that anyone is deliberately trying to undermine it. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there is a sufficient disregard for the way in which we have traditionally governed and traditionally handled the conventions of public life that that disregard is potentially damaging. If you take a, a brick out of a wall, the wall is weakened and eventually collapses. If you see bricks in the way in which we conduct public life and politics beginning to be taken out, then you should speak before the wall collapses. And that is really the background to this morning's speech. You spent quite a bit of your speech early on uh, talking about lies. Do you think that the Prime Minister has misled Parliament? Well, that's being examined at the moment. If you'll forgive me, I want to concentrate on democracy. It's bigger than the Prime Minister. I'm not just uh, going, going to do with the personalities of one man nor do I think the Prime Minister is the only person who is culpable, if indeed culpability is shown to exist at the present time. I mean, the Prime Minister is in number 10. Let me postulate a thought to you. If, it's a very unlikely thought, if Mrs Thatcher in her time had been seen to behave in the way the present Prime Minister has had, I can't imagine it, but let us assume for the moment she had, I can tell you what would have happened. 
the cabinet secretary would have been around straight away to tell her she couldn't do it. And so would Mr. Whitelaw, Lord Carrington, Sir Geoffrey Howe, and many other senior and weighty members of the cabinet. And that would have applied to others. If I'd done it, I would have had Douglas Hurd, Ken Clark, Michael Heseltine, never, never mind uh, um, uh, others uh, in, in number 10, telling me, you just cannot do that. Now, nobody in the cabinet seems to be saying, or, or indeed the cabinet secretary, seems to be saying that to the present prime minister. And that is a weakness in number 10. If people are presented very bluntly, if people speak the absolute truth to a prime minister and say, look, you, you may be making a mistake, you may not realise, but we really don't do things this way and we really can't do this, then it's likely to stop. If the prime minister has been given that advice and not accepted it, then I don't understand why the people giving that advice have not resigned. And if he has not been given that advice, either by other members of the cabinet or by the cabinet secretary, I think it is reasonable to ask why not. Thank you very much for that. Let me actually use that as a prompt to pick up a question from Alex Allen, not a stranger himself to the inner workings of government. And he says, the size of the number 10 team and particularly the number of special advisors has increased hugely since you were prime minister and the prime minister has now announced the creation of an office of the prime minister with the permanent secretary to lead number 10. What do you see as the advantages and disadvantages of this? Well, Alex Allen was my principal private secretary. He's someone for whom I have the utmost admiration. And he was indeed the official who resigned when his advice to the Prime Minister on the behaviour of a minister was not accepted. During the time Alex was in number 10 with me, <coughs> we had, I think, between 85 and 95 people in number 10. I had thought the figure was coming up to 200. I did see in an article the other day that it may be considerably higher than that. But I cannot for the life of me conceive, in the way number 10 works, that it can work credibly with that number of people, most of whom must have a job that probably doesn't need doing and certainly ought not to be done inside Downing Street. So I don't know what the Prime Minister means by setting up an office of Prime Minister. I, th I thought we'd always had one. Um, it's an interesting phrase to call it the office of the Prime Minister. We just used to call it number 10. And, and it had 70 people who worked very close. We knew one another very well. The relationships became very personal over the years in which I was there, and I know that applied to other Prime Ministers as well. It sounds a little like a gimmick. I'd like to see exactly what the office of the Prime Minister means. Um, I think we have made a mistake. I think a mistake has been made in bringing in so many special advisers into number 10. There is a role for special advisers, but I do rather think they ought to be competent to advise on, the base, advise on the basis of experience, not on the basis of intellect, however great. Experience does matter when you're dealing with government. You need someone to say, hang on, we tried that before, it doesn't work. Or I spent my lifetime, an advisor might say in the, uh, in the uh, insurance industry, what you're proposing has drawbacks. That's really what you need in number 10, not lots of clever young people running around with ideas and political ambitions of their own. So I'll wait and see what the Office of Prime Minister really means. Okay, thank you for that. Let me just ask you one more before coming to questions in the, in the room. Um, but I'm prompted because there's a whole lot of questions about the powers of Parliament, whether there are enough. There's one from David Herrera saying, is the power of the Prime Minister now so great that Parliament is no longer <coughs> sovereign? And there are several, and thank you for, 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 for that, about one from Alex Toll on um, uh, whether we need uh, to end first past the pot post voting for Westminster and local elections um, and, and replace it with PR. Well, let me take those points in, in turn. The power of the Prime Minister, I spoke in my speech about self-restraint. The power of the Prime Minister is possibly too great if there is no self-restraint. If there is self-restraint, either through innate instinct or because of the advice of those around the Prime Minister, then I think the present powers of the Prime Minister are probably as they should be. If there is no restraint, then there is a case of looking at them. But things have changed, handing more power to Parliament. The growth of the select committees, they were set up by Mr. St. John Stevens when I first went into Parliament in the late 1970s, early, early 1980s. 
and he must be delighted with the power that select committees have. They regularly report on every government, they're all party groupings, the select committee, but they regularly report on every government with constructive criticism, even though half the members will be a member of the governing party. And that is a great improvement. I think they have been a great success, and that is something in Parliament that has worked very well. I think there are reforms to Parliament. I sometimes look at Prime Minister's question time and it looks more like a circus than an attempt to hold the Prime Minister to account. I think there are ways of reforming that. I think there are other reforms that may be necessary. But Parliament does keep that under review, and I think they should. There's nothing that concerns me seriously about the powers that Parliament has. Select committees are taking more powers. I think that is right. Uh, so I don't think I would make many suggestions there. As to the voting system, you tempt me, but I'm not going to be tempted this morning. <laughs> Another time then. Let's take some questions here. Here on the aisle. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Blake, BBC News. So, John, you've been very critical today of the current Prime Minister and his government, indeed accusing him of breaking the law and actions which undermine democracy. Can you be clear whether you think those are things which Boris Johnson, Johnson should take responsibility for and resign, or should be removed from office over? And what would be your message to Conservative MPs weighing up whether to do that? It was the Supreme Court, not me, who said he broke the law. Uh, they found it, Sorry, on, on, on lockdown laws, that was um, the line I was referring to. Uh, lockdown laws are still being investigated. We, we have to wait and see whether the Prime Minister has given an accurate version of what happened to Parliament or not. And uh, I'm not going to get sidetracked into that. My purpose today was to deal with the structures defending and promoting democracy, not with dealing with the individual failures of any, possible failures of any one man. And in any event, the point I made a moment ago about those surrounding the Prime Minister who must be culpable if, there are, if mistakes have been made in terms of lockdown laws, it is not only one man who is culpable. There are a lot of other people who are culpable who should have told him this should not happen and did not. So the culpability goes wide, widely. But I'm not here to pronounce on the fate of any individual this morning. Thank you. Over here. Um, <coughs> Then just a general theoretical... Excuse me, would you like to say who you Oh, are? sorry. <laughs> um, Liz Bakes, I'm from Channel 4 News. Just a general <coughs> theoretical question about government. If any Prime Minister is found to have broken, broken the law, should they resign? That has always been the case. Thank you. Over here. Um, Sir John... In your Again, speech... Forgive me, so, uh, not used to having a bashful so, press. Would you like to say who you are? Uh, Sam Coates from Sky News. Um, <coughs> Sir John, in your speech, you make a determination. You say, at number 10, the Prime Minister and officials broke lockdown laws. That's a statement that you make without waiting for the police to pronounce. So why are you being coy? You are making an argument that the Prime Minister broke the law. You say that people who mislead at the dispatch box should resign. Why are you not being plain with your language today? There's a distinction between lying to Parliament and breaking the lockdown laws. If the Prime Minister is shown to have lied to Parliament, and by lied I mean deliberately lied, not, mistaken, not made a mistake in what he said, let me draw that distinction. If the Prime Minister has found he has deliberately lied, it has always been the case that Prime Ministers resign. But as far as the lockdown laws are concerned, uh, there seems little doubt that they have been broken. That is liable to a fine of a couple of hundred pounds. And quite what the proposition for that will be, we have to wait the police report. And I don't think it would be prudent, wise or fair of me to prejudge that. And I don't intend to. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to come back in a moment to more <coughs> in, in the room. Um, so please keep them coming. But let me just uh, take a couple coming in. Uh, one from Gus O'Donnell <coughs> saying, do you think that the Prime Minister should immediately sign up to all the recommendations of the Committee in, of Standards in Public Life, which you set up in 1994? You've already said in your speech, yes. Um, I wonder if you can take that further and say what might cause that to come about. Well, le let me say, the proposals, there was a 2019 report by the Select Committee on, Sta uh, by the Committee on Standards in Public Life that still has not been responded to by the government three years on. 
That has not been responded to at all. It would be quite a good idea to get that out the drawer and decide what it said, look at what it said and, and respond to it as a matter of courtesy. The report of Lord Evans, who was a recent speaker here, I believe, the report of Lord Evans uh, late last year is with the Prime Minister now and makes some very uh, clear-cut recommendations. Not all of them will be easy for the Prime Minister to swallow because it takes prerogatives away from the Prime Minister in some cases <coughs> and puts it in uh, independent hands. And those independent hands would be given, under Lord Evans' proposals, the, uh, the prerogative of uh, legislative parliamentary approval. So I do think the Prime Minister would be wise to accept that. Wise to accept it in his own defence. If he turns it down and then is faced with a very difficult decision and makes one that is widely unpopular, he will face a storm of criticism. He can avoid that. He can avoid that by handing this power uh, to, to uh, uh, the people recommended by Lord Evans. So we do need the people who run the ethics committees, who keep an eye, eye, an eye on what happens in public life. Firstly, they should be independently appointed. There should be an independent chairman of the committees that appoint them. They should not just be focused out. You should, don't just decide who you want to run Ofcom and try and promote him. It should be an independent process. And then that process, that committee, should have statutory backing so that it can initiate investigations of its own and its reports can, uh, can and should be accepted uh, by the Prime Minister of the day. That protects public life. It also protects the Prime Minister. And I don't think it helps when these issues come up from time to time. Sometimes uh, a huge fuss is made out of something very little. But those huge fusses are damaging. They're damaging to government. They're damaging to the respect of government. And they're damaging to ministers as well. That can be avoided. So my view is quite clear, having carefully studied Lord Evans' recommendations and understanding that some of them will be difficult for the Prime Minister to accept, I think he would be wise to accept them all and wise to accept them all without qualification and as soon as possible. Thank you. Let's come back to the room here. <coughs> yeah. um, Sir John Major, Nick okay. Watt from yeah, BBC thank News. You. Thank you. Um, you've talked about Boris Johnson's government and you've talked about lying but I've not heard a specific charge sheet against a specific individual. So can I ask you the following? Did Boris Johnson lie or tell the truth when he said that if we leave the European Union, we'd be richer by £350 million a week? Did Boris Johnson lie or did he tell the truth when after signing the Northern Ireland Protocol, he downplayed the prospect of Great Britain Northern Ireland checks? And did Boris Johnson lie or tell the truth when questioned about the first party in Downing Street, he said there was no party. If you think he lied in any one of those instances, is that a fair judgment by you, or as his allies would say, is this part of a 30-year vendetta by you against Boris Johnson, which dates back to when you were Prime Minister, he was the Brussels correspondent, and in his words, he used to lob grenades into the Conservative Party. Well, if I go back to his reporting, uh, I think there's a fine distinction between a lie. Let me simply say his reporting was often widely mistaken and short of fact. He was once given an invitation from a senior Foreign Office official that if he was putting any more stories into the public, uh, into the public arena, he could check with the Foreign Office and this official would check the, uh, that, that, that they were factually accurate before he posted them. Uh, and his response to the, uh, uh, to the person concerned was, it might be one phone call too many. So he was certainly mistaken. Uh, on the European issue, <coughs> whether that was a lie or whether it was a mistake, I don't know. It was certainly wrong. It was certainly wrong. I, I, I haven't noticed an extra 350 million being lobbed up on a weekly basis towards the uh, health service. I have noticed billions and billions and billions as the current cost of Brexit. I did hear courtesy of the BBC this morning of the problems of the pig farmers uh, and the fact that large numbers of pigs are now being, uh, now being slaughtered uh, without going through the food chain. There are problems like that in many other areas. The difficulties for importers and exporters are now absolutely acute. These are all subjects for 
another day and not today. I am tempted this morning, but I resisted the temptation. So you're leading me in a direction I don't wish to go this morning. Sorry, your third point was? Um, it was three questions were 350 million, and it was when you signed the Northern Ireland Protocol. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm glad you're glad I asked you what it was. Um, <clears throat> you may remember in 2016 that Tony Blair and I went together, an unlikely duo, you may think, went together to Northern Ireland to warn of the dangers to Northern Ireland of, uh, of the protocol and of the peace process, and to the peace process. We warned then, and as I recall, uh, not too gently told by the then Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and the then leader of the DUP that neither Mr Blair nor I knew anything about Ireland and we should pipe down. Well, it looks as though we might have known a little about it from the difficulties that exist at the present time. The Northern Ireland Protocol was arguably one of the worst pieces of negotiation that uh, we have seen in recent history. It is causing an enormous amount of trouble. Whether <coughs> anyone deliberately misled about that, I can't say. Certainly they were mistaken. But it does help if you sign treaties if you understand them before you sign them. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm coming over here. Aletha, did you have a question? Yes, please. Hi, Sir John. Aletha Adi from the Daily Mirror. I've got a few questions. You've been utterly condemning of the impact Boris Johnson and his government have had on our international standing in the world. So what do you think it would take for us to be able to rebuild that reputation? Would we need a new cabinet? Would we need a new prime minister? And if Boris Johnson were to resign, hypothetically, how long do you think it would take us to rebuild that? And also, just for clarification, um, do you think he should resign if the Metropolitan Police were to find him to have broken the laws? I'm not going to answer the last point. Um, I'm not going to uh, cut away everything else I've been saying about democracy to provide one headline like that. So, no, I'm not going to answer that point. The, um, uh, the earlier point about regaining our standards, it, it, it's a matter of how we collectively behave, uh, how we deal with the, the uh, honouring of uh, international agreements we have signed, how we begin to take a lead in the international community on immense, uh, that are of wide international interest. For example, the Foreign Secretary today is in Moscow meeting her counterpart. Um, I welcome that. Uh, the Prime Minister had a brief conversation, I gather, with President Putin about Ukraine. But the President of France had a five-hour meeting across the desk. Now, that would typically have been us. In years gone by, in the Foreign Affairs Council, when there was discussions over Russia, it was the British Foreign Secretary, it was the Douglas Hurd of the day, or the Robin Cook of the day, who would have led the discussions. Now, we need to get us, we can't, we've left Europe, but it's an illustration of how I do not think our weight in the international community is as strong as it was, or as we would wish it to be. And that takes a while. And of course, people look at us and they look at our standards in government and they look at what we do and what we say and how we behave and they react to what we do and say. And so it can be rebuilt. I hope it will be rebuilt. Uh, it's more than personalities. It's the policies of the government and the behaviour of the government as a whole across a whole range of different issues that will actually rebuild the trust. There are international things that need someone to propose them. I'm not sure the West has a leader at the moment in the way we traditionally have had. And there's the opportunity for different countries to take the lead on different issues. I would like to see our country doing so, looking at some of the international problems and trying to convene people to come together to try and solve those problems. I gave the illustration of trying to find an international, uh, uh, an international concordat on how to deal with the rising tide of migration from Africa and elsewhere that is causing immense difficulties for governments in Europe and of course for us too. It won't be easy, it's terribly difficult, it's hard, hard grind. But unless someone starts bringing the international community together, nothing will happen. And as the years go on, the problem will worsen. 
and then it'll become almost impossible to solve it. So I would like to see Britain looking at initiatives like that. Now, perhaps that is about to happen. I think it would be in our interests to look at issues like that and to try and take a lead. We may fail. Other countries may not be prepared to play ball and join us in those things. That's entirely possible. But we should try. And I think governments should do that. And I think it earns respect when they try, even when other governments aren't willing to join them in the endeavour. Thank you. I'll cut, try and get two more from the room uh, at the end, but I want to take some online. There's some terrific questions here. Let me take one from Claire Foster Gilbert. Um, he was saying that uh, a few years ago when you were talking at Westminster Abbey, you, talk, you said that suggested that the Chinese would eventually demand democracy as their standard of living improved. And she's asking whether you think democracy is naturally desired by people. Well, it's beginning to look questionable. And it's beginning to look questionable in some areas for a very logical reason. Um, if you look at the, path, the, the, the large part of the world that does not live with the standards of the Western world, who are worried about feeding themselves and clothing themselves, the most important thing to them is to have a job, have a home, to have a full belly. And the autocracies, because they don't have to face the difficulties of democracy, the democracies, particularly China, have been able to grow their economies much faster than the Western democracies. And that is attractive to many countries. So we do have to continue to argue the case for democracy. As people become better off, their concerns will widen beyond the very basics of life and they will want freedoms that we have enjoyed in our country for almost forever. And that isn't true in many countries and they're focused upon the absolute basics of life. And if they see that the autocracies, despite the lack of freedom, are actually able, in some instances, to provide uh, an economy that lifts people out of abject policy, poverty, they will find that attractive. Mm. Now, I think that democracy is infinitely the best of any forms of government we have ever had. But I can quite see for people at the absolute bottom of the heap, it is not their first concern. Thank you. Robert Morland, thank you for your question on the Northern Ireland Protocol, which I think we're going to have to leave there. Um, Sir John has talked quite a bit about that. Um, Paula Keaveney asked one, saying, Charles Clark said dealing with political funding was one of those items in the too difficult box. Do you think change is possible? Well, well I hope so. Um, I mean, the amount of money that we run our politics on, compared to the way we toss billions around, uh, is actually quite modest. Uh, the damage done to uh, our political system by the repeated scandals of one sort or another. Uh, someone has been put in the Lords because they gave money. Well, that may be true. Or it may simply be that in addition to giving money, they've opened a whole load of schools for kids, they've done a huge amount for charity, they've run a big business and earned millions for the country. Um, but nonetheless, if they've been a donor, that, that old uh, uh, criticism comes up time and time again, and sometimes it's justified. So. I think it is worth removing that, uh, that problem from the political scene. But isn't what you're suggesting, wouldn't it re re result in less money? I mean, you're talking about... Well, more... yes, it would result in less, less money from donors, most yeah. certainly. But uh, the, the political parties have quite happily let... In each of the main political parties have quite happily let their branch structures up and down the country which raise money for them wither away and die the active membership of the, of the three main political parties, or certainly the two main political parties, is much less than it used to be. Constituencies that had 30 branches raising money on a weekly basis now have five. So the political parties have happily let that go, and that has placed a greater reliance on large donations from a small number of individuals. Now, I think that is inherently damaging. And either they recreate the branches, which doesn't seem imminently likely, or they need an increase, I don't think it would be mega, an increase in the amount of state funding beyond that which they now have. And that would enable us to limit the amount of donations from individuals, from companies, mm. and from trade unions. And I think that would be healthy for our politics. Thank you. Unpopular, but no. healthy. All right, thank you. 
Um, I'll give him one from Matthew Taylor. Relying on the honour of uh, members of parliament to self-regulate our parliamentary democracy seems, seems no longer sufficient. He says, how should we hold members to account for misleading statements and not answering perfectly proper questions? Yes, that's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to know how you hold them to account other than by exposing what they have said as being mistaken. Uh, you could do that on a daily basis. But I repeat a point I made earlier. The vast majority of politicians um, do not knowingly mislead. They, they may provide a wrong statistic. I well remember in the early 90s, on a Friday afternoon, Tony Newton, one of the nicest men who was ever in politics, came rushing round to number 10, white, white as a sheet, saying, I just made a terrible mistake. I've released the unemployment figures on a Friday afternoon and I shouldn't have done that because Parliament wasn't sitting. Um, I don't think anybody would raise much of an eyebrow at that today. But it is things like that where you obeyed what looks like a silly convention but didn't try to find a good day to bury bad news, to borrow an old phrase, is the sort of thing Parliament should do. Where, where, where people mislead, I think they have to be called out, but I don't know what other sanction you can do. If they absolutely lie at the dispatch box, then the position is quite clear and always has been. They resign. And uh, a couple of resignations, or even one, would probably improve the standard of veracity no end. But I don't know in Parliament generally how you could do that. Okay, thank you. I've got a cluster of questions about whether it would have been more democratic uh, a view to grant referendum or on the EU. I've got one from Stephanie Hayden saying, do you think that had you granted a referendum on Maastricht, the UK would perhaps still be in the EU today? Another one saying, do you regret creating the conservative Eurosceptic movement by ramming through Maastricht? And there are quite a lot what? on that theme. What? Right. Would you mind oh. saying that again? I'm not sure I heard that right. Um, no, don't bother. Yeah, I heard it perfectly yeah, well. Yeah, no. uh, I think there's More a democratic to have, a, have, have granted the, a referendum. Yes, it was, uh, it was creating the Eurosceptic movement that made me raise an eyebrow. Yeah. My goodness, that was there right from uh, Mr. Walker Smith way, way back in the 1970s. The Eurosceptic movement has always been there. As for Maastricht, I'm glad that question was asked because there is one distinct difference. Before I went to Maastricht, I presented in detail to the House of Commons what my negotiating position was and after a debate the House of Commons approved my negotiating position by uh, about 500 votes to 100, something of that sort. It was a massive negotiating mandate for me at Maastricht and I stuck strictly to that mandate. I brought back everything they asked and I didn't leave off the table anything they asked. So, it's hardly a question of ramming something through Parliament. What happened was that was in the Parliament from 87 to 92. In, 90, in, in the 92 Parliament, lots of the senior members in Parliament who had been in the war or immediately post-war, who knew the most important thing in the world was to make sure there was never another war with Europe, left Parliament and lots of young ideologues came into Parliament with a quite different view. So Parliament, had, Parliament as an institution had approved my negotiating position and as British Prime Minister I had given my word on the basis of that parliamentary approval to other heads of government in uh, the European Union which is why they gave me what I was asking for. Mm. And now I go back to Parliament and a new group of MPs say it doesn't matter that you as Prime Minister with parliamentary approval gave your word on behalf of the British nation, we now wish you to break your word. Now, if I had done that, I don't think Britain's name in the world would have been very good at all. And what was I supposed to be having a referendum on? I was I supposed to be having a referendum on for no reason at all that we should suddenly leave the European Union. Twenty years afterwards, with all the activities of the Euro, parts of the Eurosceptic media and the Eurosceptic movement, only by the tiniest of majorities did the uh, vote to leave Europe go through on 37% of the electorate. Don't talk to me about the will of the people. The will of the people was 37% of the electorate on the basis of a great number of things which in retrospect, I put this kindly, turn out to have been mistaken. Now, these days it's very popular in some quarters to say that we got Brexit done and people cheer. 
uh, if events continue as they are now, the time will come in the not too distant future when the people who are cheering will be rather sullen. So I think that uh, it was quite right to behave as I did. And it would have been utterly dishonorable for a British Prime Minister to break his word to all the other nations in Europe on the basis that the composition of Parliament had suddenly decided that it didn't like what Parliament had previously agreed to. Is thank that clear? Th th it is clear. Um, thank you for that. We're going to have to draw uh, to a close. I'm, I'm going to take one more in the room in a second. But thank you for the terrific questions coming in. Thank you, Alistair Burt, um, uh, Caroline Slocock, John Burt, um, many, many others, Liz Gardner, about whistleblowing. Lots of terrific questions coming in about um, all kinds of constitutional aspects. We would need a lot longer to discuss all this. I'll take one last question here. Thank you. Uh, uh, Daniel Hugh from ITV News. Um, you mentioned in your uh, speech that ministers are being evasive and looking foolish with their pre-prepared answers. D do you believe those in the cabinet that have defended Boris Johnson are complicit in his alleged lies and rule breaking? And one more, if I may. Your, uh, no, just, uh, sorry, actually, one. Uh, your time in government ended um, in allegations of sleaze, cash for questions, your party divided, and you were heavily punished by the electorate. If Boris Johnson stays in office, do you believe he'll suffer the same fate? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm never going to anticipate what the electorate do. I was never, never very good at that, and I'm not sure I'm any better now than I was before. Uh, as far as the sleaze was concerned, if I could draw a distinction, the sleaze then was individual backbenchers. And the occasions when the government was involved, like arms to Iraq, it actually related to something that happened in the 1980s but just happened to become public in the 1990s. So if I might make that distinction. There was sleaze. Cash for questions was awful, and it was why I acted to set up the Nolan Committee. I, I feel as felt as strongly about that then as, as many other people, and, and that was exactly why I did that. I'm not going to judge what is going to happen now. I'm just not going to do it. My focus today is on beginning to indicate the dangers there will be in letting go of the traditional ways in which we conduct our politics. And I repeat what I said earlier, I'm not suggesting our system is going to fall to pieces or anything stupid like that. Of course it isn't. But I do suggest if you keep nibbling away at something, it does damage. And I think we are fortunate to have had overall as clean a system of public life as any country I know. Uh, and I'm proud of that. And it's never going to be perfect. Humans are humans and they are fallible. Uh, but I think we should uh, do whatever we can to sound the alarm if we think even in the smallest of ways that we're veering off the path that has served us so well in the past. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for terrific questions. I'm so sorry for all the ones I couldn't get in, but there is a, a flood of interest in talking to John Major about these, these points. Thank you very much, those of you here, for coming. Thank you very much, those of you online, for joining us. And there will be a full recording of this, as I said, up there. With that, can you join me in thanking Sir John Major? Thank you.